All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of uh, Three Comic Money. Uh, what were the guys were we're here always, but this time this week we have Bob Sally. Um, hopefully you know him uh, because he has an awesome book that just came out last week. Um, it's as he likes to. If you follow him on Instagram and Facebook, he's been telling there it's sold out at Midtown, and then it's uh, it's selling out at other places. Evidently, it's going to be at a few more stores this week because Diamond is Diamond, and we all love Diamond and hate Diamond at the same time. Uh, but uh, it's sort of exciting. But we're going to play the game, and we're going to talk his comics. Um, but once again, this is Three Comic Money. This is uh, CBSI. Uh, it's comicbookinvest.com. So let's get started with the game, Bob, and you'll get to pick the first card for the game. All right. All right. So, yeah, pick one, two, or three, and where the picture is hidden behind. Uh, two. Two. All right, you got two. Mike? I'm going three this week. All right, let's do one. All right. Let it go. Oh. It's number three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we decided to go with your uh, emoji image there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to pick for, like, my emoji like, has more muscle tone than I do. I, I, I like good <laughs> emoji. <laughs> I have zero muscle tone as I as I go. Uh, first, I used to. I think at some point in a past life, somewhere. All right. So, so Mike, how are you going to start us off with Kickstarter books? Okay, so I'm starting off with a book that isn't available yet. The Kickstarter is done for it, um, and, and I'm not even a hundred percent positive it counts as a comic. But I really this when I when we got this topic, I really loved the idea that the whole idea around Kickstarters is supporting the projects that you like and the, and the projects that you believe in and the creators that you believe in. And uh, this is a piece, uh, Monster Dance is a piece that's coming from um, ma um, from Madeline Editions. And it is, all the art is done by Guy Gilchrist. Uh, he's a guy who does a lot of local signings and art uh, and, and commissions and stuff around the Nashville area where Chris and I are. I get to talk to him all, all the time. He's a, he's a really great guy, very supportive of the area. And as a result, I kind of wanted to, toss it back out at him. I love his work. Um, he, you know, he's worked with Muppet Babies and TMNT. And um, I think he worked on Nancy and Sluggo for a really long time. He's sort of been all over the industry for, for decades now. Um, and this is a cool sort of timely thing. Uh, this story is a metaphor around sort of COVID pandemic being a monster and the little girl sort of making it a big thing in her mind and, um, and, and her dog kind of reminding her that uh, that it's that it's really not that big. It's actually something rather small and that you create these big monsters in your mind and they're not really they're not really fully real. Uh, it's a really cool metaphor. I'm really looking forward to getting the copy of this. Um, like I said, Guy's a great guy and I really like supporting his stuff and, and I and I'm really excited for this. Especially I have a I have a kid. I have a one and a half year old so this is going to be very kid based and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this with him as well. I don't normally go kid picks. I usually go like butts and boobs. But uh, <laughs> uh, and don't worry, don't worry later on in the show I will but uh, but for but for my first pick this is this is a important one to me and, and I'm uh, I'm looking forward to getting this one. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Oh, it is me. Uh, I guess I'm Fudging a slight bit. I thought this was a Kickstarter. It's not technically, but it's a. Uh, it's that. It was on Netflix. Raising Dion. Uh, yeah. This was a print to own, um, which is just such a, a weird concept to me. I mean, I have no clue what the print one would be because it's print to own. Uh, it's actually. A, I watched the first few episodes of the show. It was actually a pretty good show. Just the entire concept of a. I mean, it's nothing new, but like, oh, all of a sudden, I have superpowers, and it's now. But it's it's all told from the perspective of the mom how the mom deals with a son who has these developing superpowers and she's a, a stay at home or not. She's a working mom. And it's a pretty cool little concept. The arts in it. It's not too bad. I like it. Um, I don't know. Uh, and I print to own Bob, have you ever done anything with print to own books? Is that, have you tried that print to own? Yeah. Or print, uh, print, print on demand, not print to own print on. Demand. Um, well, yeah. So I did that when I first started um, self publishing. Uh, Kapow. Oh, no. God, is it Kapow? Uh, if you're talking about those Kapow, Kaboom? Kaboom. Yeah. The kids' version of Boom Studio uh, stuff? Yeah. So uh, Kaboom was like where you could, uh, it was kind of, I mean, it cost a lot. Like, I mean, it was in, to, you know, this when you finally get into the industry and you see how much it actually costs to print one of these. Um, you know, you, I was printing them at like $3.99 each. 
Mm-hmm. So of course, then like, you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't, everybody was like, yeah, you know, you sell it for 10 bucks. You know, people will buy an indie comic for 10 bucks. And I'm like, that's insane. So I'm buying these things at $3, <laughs> paying for shipping and all that. And I'm selling them for like five bucks. And, but it was a lot like, of profit made in that, huh? <laughs> right, right. You know, but um, yeah. So, I mean, like, but you could also, what they had was you could, you put your uh, comic on there and people could go on and download it. Or I'm okay. sorry, they could get it print on demand and ship to them. And I think like one time they sent me like a thing and it was like a check for like 15 cents. But it was, uh, <laughs> they showed you like how many people like, bought it to print to own. And you were just like that in your mind, like that's wild. Like, you know, yeah. eight people bought my comic last year. Uh, right. you know, and it was like, so, so can I go online right now and still print those books? Like, I don't, th- <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, it's very, you know, if it is like, you know, you probably could, uh, you know, for collectors, you know, if it's got that freaking hound comics pub box on that, I'm just like, I swore to myself, I would never speak their name again, but uh, <laughs> that one's probably worth a lot of money just because of my hatred for it. <laughs> well, that's sort of like Mike talked about a few weeks ago. With, uh, we had a musician on. They were talking about the royalty checks that just sort of randomly stroll in. And this is where Pete's going to drop in the Mike's favorite picture in the world. And, uh, oh, man. <laughs> I'm my first one. Right but, Mike, yeah, uh, haven't you said like you just randomly will get a check for like 20 cents or $10? Yeah, or- yeah. Because it's streaming now, you know, nobody buys physical copies of those things anymore. And so you get streaming royalties and it's like one one hundredth of a cent every time somebody streams it. And you'll get I work through through um, APM music licensing for my stuff. It's Sony, essentially. And you'll get these checks for like a dollar twenty, you know, four dollars and sixty six cents for like fifteen thousand streams. And you're like. Wait a minute. So fifteen thousand people listen to my music, and all I get is a dollar. How is that yeah. possible? Yeah. But but it's you know you figure well it's getting out there. People are seeing it, and and I think that that's the same mm-hmm. sort of idea with with this with the comic stuff. Is a lot of these creators just want their stuff in people's hands. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the money, sure, you want enough money to continue making the art, right? I mean, you, you hope that it'll pay for itself at least. Um, but I guess you know at a certain point you have to kind of just roll with it and say, well, I do this because I love it. And maybe well, I had to put a little, in, get a little. Out. That's, yeah. I mean, that's very true. Like, uh, I don't think I'd be where I am right now if I didn't give away probably more than 75% of my comics, you know, I would go to, con- and, and, I, and I always went into it, not looking at it. Like I wanted to, I, you know, I didn't go into it looking like I wanted to make money on it. And that's probably talking to the three of you. You're like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, I uh, I didn't like I, I didn't think like you know I'm I'm gonna make a fortune doing this I just wanted to do it and so if I was at conventions and I had I remember I remember being at conventions where I had like issue one only issue one printed of Salvagers and uh, and that's a hard sell like I mean even now like I could do it but like it's hard to be like I have one copy of something you have no idea who I am or what this is. And in your mind, you're probably thinking there's a 99% chance that there's not going to be an issue too. But yes, I'm going to buy this for five bucks because <laughs> you know, I see that you you know you love it. Um, but I you know at the end of the day, like I'd always have more than what I you know I'd be like I, I didn't sell I, I didn't sell out. So at the end of the day, like it would be like the last maybe hour at a convention, I would hand my books out. Uh, Cause I was just like, I don't want to take them home. I'd rather somebody being at a convention that loves comics to go home with my comic. And hopefully if I can get one of those people to like it and come back for more, then that's worth it. So that's kind of like what I did. I mean, I like, there was a point where like source prime press was like, you know, take down the free PDF that you just gave out to everybody on Twitter. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're trying to sell the book. But I, you know, and I'd be like, all right, you know, but like, you know, you're hoping like, well, hopefully, you know, 10 people downloaded it and are reading it. Uh, I would give away all my comics if I could just to, you know, get the feedback from people, you know, that are reading it and telling you like how much they love it and how much they appreciate it. Uh, That's, I mean, that's the true nature of this is like, you have a story inside you that you want to tell. And just like an artist, if an artist paints something and throws it in his closet and nobody sees it, what's the point? You know, so a writer, when he comes up with a story, if it doesn't go out to people, then what was the point? So my, I guess my question would be, because I've, I've, I've sold it a few shows and been to like, and I've been to some just crap hole, like little towns 
it's a sellout. And Mike's been to a few of these shows where I've and he he didn't he didn't even bother coming to one of them because he's like, are you kidding? You're driving two hours down back roads in Kentucky to do a show. But like I went to one of these shows and lo and behold, behind me was a guy selling his book like you would be doing. And it's just like you're you're selling to the 20 people who are coming because they heard that Jake Scott Campbell was a hot artist and, and Spawn was the best book to buy. And you're just like, now this is last year. This is not 10 years ago. This yeah. is last year. And that's the books they're coming to look for. And you're just like, I'm so sorry. You're selling this book called Proxy. And then Mike and I can go to the dollar store and they're in the, the dollar bins because no one, everyone took the free ones and they took them to the, but I, and I felt bad for the guy, but I, I, his book was in it. I love the concept. And I, I, it was like that weird, like, I don't know how to take this, yeah. but I mean, how, how do you, how do you deal with, you're always going to get those weird reactions at first of oh, with your stuff. When you're, when you're like at a convention and like you're trying to sell your stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, you get rejected way more than you actually, you know, get somebody to actually buy, buy it. So, uh, you know, you, you have to be ready for that. Uh, the classic is, you know, when you're sitting there talking to somebody and you give them your whole spiel and they look like they're real interested and then they hand it back and they say, good luck with that. And then they walk <laughs> away. Uh, you know, but it happens enough now. Like, I don't know. Like, I always think like I've worked with people that get really discouraged. Um, but you're just I think it's all about how you go into it. You know, like if if you're going into being being in the comic book industry with any of your own expectations, then you're probably going to get let down. Uh, you need to go into doing comics with a very open mind because, I mean, it is soul crushing. Mm. You know, there are times like, you talk to anybody who has created comics and they will tell you that they have come to points where they were going to quit probably like once daily. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you just uh, you have to be able to take the rejection. You have to understand that it's not personal against you. Uh, you know, somebody saying like that they're not interested in buying your comic doesn't mean that your comic is shit. Um, you know, and it's just a matter, I think, of, you know, believing in the story that you're telling. Um, you know, just if you if you back it, if you love it, then nobody passing it by can make you feel, you know, any less about what you created. So we're going to jump into your one of your books you're going to show because I want to talk about what sells a book, sadly, and is you, you don't sell a book quite as much as the guy who draws it. And you got a book there, I think, with, from one of your guys. I mean, I, to when you when you're, I mean, your story can sell it, but I, I'm sorry, I'm an art guy. I first look at the pictures. And well, I mean, that's for a lot of, and that, that's what comics sell. The, the pictures sell and then a good story. I mean, now when I look back, I mean, I look at runs that Bendis have done and I look at runs that Snyder's done and it doesn't matter the artist. The artist enhances it. But the writer, but it takes a while to get there. The artist has to draw me in, right? Um, and I know well, you have a book that you want to share for yours with that has your guy. Yeah, and I, again, like uh, your point is very valid. Um, I think art always is what it seems like when you're, especially when you're just starting out. And one of the reasons we are doing, um, you know, Kickstarter books is it's self-publishing. A lot of people out there. I mean, obviously now you have Scott Snyder who's doing a Kickstarter. Um, you know, the Keanu Reeves book is on Kickstarter, but I mean, Kickstarter for its all intents and purposes was for people, you know, that had an idea and didn't have a publisher and were trying to figure out how to, how are they going to get their books out to fans? Uh, how was I going, you know, how am I going to fund this book? And that's what Kickstarter was for, but Kickstarter, like everything evolves into, you know, a means of, uh, you know, you know, getting your book out there now for anybody. So it's more, it's almost like a virtual convention. So I backed this book last month. It came out. I, well, I actually just got it in the mail and I haven't read it yet, uh, but it's by How do you Stephanie. Say that name? Yeah. Is that light bad? Oh, What's goes. the name of the book? So I want you to try to say it. <laughs> um, I was saying that it's a Ionian. <laughs> Too many vowels. Yeah. Aeonian. A -E -I -O -N. Aeonian. Is that yeah. Alien, like the, yeah. So Stephanie Maynard is a mutual friend. Uh, we've met at conventions. You know, she's a you know, self-publishing, independently published uh, comic book writer. Uh, and obviously we have uh, Broken Gargoyles team of Stanyak and Robert Nugent, the colorist, doing the, the artwork on it. 
along with uh, Rob Jones, who's doing the lettering. And I mean, you can just see the artwork. And I'm sure if I know Stephanie, that she has made a very compelling story. But um, this book, obviously, this book caught my eye because of Stan's work, Stan's artwork on it. Uh, but also, um, I know Stephanie, and uh, I trust her as a writer. That uh, you know, she's not gonna, you know, she's she's if she's doing it, she's doing it because she's passionate about it. So uh, obviously, when I saw that on Kickstarter, without a doubt, I was jumping in. And normally, because I back so many Kickstarters, I usually do digital, which my other two um, are digital. But this one, for the love of the uh, artistic team. I had to uh, I had to get the print copies. Yeah. Uh, the story is the story is about a family who has figured out the secret to immortality, and you go through at what cost does it you know is it for them? Very cool, cool. I, I might actually have to look that up now. Is it is it still no? It's not. It's done now. Yeah, it's done, and they've been shipping it out. And again, the, this was another one I picked up because uh, it is not on. It's not connected to a publisher. So it is, uh, uh, for all intents, is, it is creator-owned and it is self-published. You can even see, I don't know if we're throwing out, you can edit it later, but, you know, she got this printed herself from, you know, Comics Well, which, Wellspring, which I know a lot of independent self-published uh, creators use um, as a means okay. to printing their books. That's cool. All right, Pete, what do you have for your first book? Oh, my first book. All right, let me get my... Uh... So lay it up. So my first, uh, a buddy of mine told me about this. It was on Kickstarter, and it was just kind of like a interesting kind of a Conan meets Mad Max kind of idea. This uh, Wailing Blade, and I, oh, yeah. the, and I got the two, the silver, and then there was a gold version. And this did hit shops eventually, yeah. but uh, I, it was on Kickstarter before it went to shops. And this is Comics Tribe, so this is still a smaller, uh, smaller end publisher, but. Uh, it was an interesting, uh, yeah, interesting little book, and you know they get some extra free little stickers type stuff with this, and uh, depending on how much you you know you put in, you can get uh, different uh, levels of books, and there's like a ton of other variants for that one, but uh, those are the two that I that I got for that, and I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, I remember that one came in when it was coming into the shops. Like all of a sudden, lots of stores um, started having they had their own variant because I think, and Bob, you can definitely speak to this. The uh, once. You, Smaller print stuff can easily get. Uh, it's a lot easier to get a exclusive variant for a store than oh, yeah. like a Marvel book or anything. Uh, so. Yeah, and and I was shocked at that. Like I didn't, you know, I I didn't expect that was a whole part of the process because I mean we were very new to. Well, I was very new to being distributed through previews and Diamond. Um, and my first book was Salvagers, the trade paperback which I think we got 85 orders for, which sucked. And it's one again, one of those moments where you just feel like maybe I don't, you know, maybe I'm not going to cut it out in this industry. Um, but, you know, we, we figured out that trade paperbacks don't really do as well in diamond as uh, floppies do. Um, but once ogre came out and that hit, like, I mean, it was like people would, again, it was my first uh, time because anytime I, you know, an artist was working on pages, I'd go to other artists and I'd be like, hey, I'd love for you to do a pinup of my characters. And you'd pay them to do it. And, uh, you know, and after, you know, after a while, you're like, I can't keep affording to do this. And then Ogre came out and it was just like people were just throwing like, you know, beautiful images of your characters. And uh, it was just awesome. And then that's when, you know, we started doing like next thing I knew it was. You know, we're doing all these different store variants, and that's you know when I get this big box of uh, comps sent to me, and and I just start shipping them off to everybody. <laughs> but, well, but it was awesome. It was and it and it did. It opened my eyes because I never, I've never experienced that. When I was a kid growing up buying comic books, like I didn't look for variants. It was just like I need oh, X Men yeah. two forty two. You know, and, yeah. and that was it. And it's just like give me it and go. Um, but yeah, now the variants are out there and they're just awesome. And it's and it's great because it gives other artists uh, work. Mm -hmm. And it also, if you do it right, like it brings another person into your creative team. Yeah. And you know, getting more and more eyes. Like right now, I have Mike Lilly doing the layouts for Broken Gargoyles number three. And uh, you know, it just became a time crunching thing. Where mm -hmm. I said I was like Stan, I'm Mike. I knew Mike Lilly from a, a project I edited on, 
And I asked him if he'd be interested in doing it. And he said, yeah. So now that's another name that gives your title exposure. So, you know, the more and more that you can bring on other creatives, I think like um, there was a point where I was like, I think I'm going to hire a penciler and hire an inker, you know, that way I can have another name on it. So yeah. <laughs> the variants are great for that. You know, like I know that um, Ben Templesmith did uh, a couple variants yeah. for some source point press boot, uh, books and they did phenomenal, and you know, and it gets his fan base to. He did the did no heroin, the one for five variant yeah, for the he, no like, heroin, no more. The first one he did, I think, was like, I think he did one for one of Ben Goldsmith's books, um, and that's how we kind of. And then doing that one, mm -hmm. it was like, all right, that did well, so let's do another one mm -hmm. like with him. So, uh, yeah, it's great. It's great. The variants are great for exposure too for both parties. Yeah, it's cool. All right, Mike. So who are you going to expose now? Oh. <laughs> Come on, uh, so, <laughs> no, not yet. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that for last. I should say I didn't, I didn't mention before, and actually this kind of leads into a question as well, but I didn't say uh, Monster Dance, the one that I featured as my first one, um, the Guy Gilchrist one. The story is by Eva Lau. I want to make sure I, I threw that out there too, just so everyone knows that as well. Um, and it's, it's actually, it started as a, a, like an audio thing with, with visuals and stuff. And I guess by demand, it ended up being a printed thing. So I guess that's, I guess that's becoming more common that people will try things out digitally first. And then if they, if there's a demand for it through the Kickstarter or through whatever, then they'll actually print up copies, um, which is a nice way to not waste money, I guess, right. um, just to make sure that you're going to sell what you, what you got. But, but, um, but I like the fact that it also opens up the uh, sort of more prestigious level of publishing um, it might allow someone to do um, a more in-depth project that's a little bit more intricate and, and uh, deluxe, if you will. So that if they get a little bit more money from their backers, they might be able to come up with a, with a nicer product. And honestly, one of the nicest products I've seen come through a Kickstarter in the last few years uh, is this John Boy Meyer sketchbook. Um, which uh, and, and John Boy's been great to us on the show as well as the website. This is one beautiful publication, um, slip cased, um, just just gorgeous, a gorgeous hardcover, really really well done. The interior is gorgeous, uh, really uh, amazing stock. All the pages have the um, have the corners rounded on it. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, Try oh, yeah. to show, it. Um, but like little touches like that. That I feel like you, you it, it would almost be cost prohibitive to do if you were just publishing through a, ma a main publisher, but this allows the creator, I think, to really put their vision on the market exactly the way they saw it. Um, and I, and I, just knowing John Boy, I know that he wanted to put out something that was really beautiful, um, and the and the Kickstarter allowed him to do that. And this is this is a really gorgeous a really gorgeous piece. I, I, I love it. Um, and I know you guys. I know you guys have them too. Or Pete, yours is on the way. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris has one, and I have a couple of copies too. But um, just, just a really beautiful thing. Well, nice. and and that's what uh, we talked about because we mentioned the Scott Snyder one. That, that it seems like the bigger artists they come in, that's what they try to do first. Or like John Boy, I don't know if he had a Kickstarter before that, but like Snyder's doing that. The Keanu thing, which amazes me. I'm like, why is this a Kickstarter when they've advertised yeah. this from the get go? But they, well, this is only available. On his yeah. on his site, that's the only other way to get it now. The Kickstarter is over for this, um, but it allowed it to get funded so that he just sells this through his site. Um, it's published by probably should figure that out. Published by him. It's just it's straight straight through him. Just artist owned yeah. publisher. Yeah. So that's that's cool. So it's not picked up by anybody. It's just for his website, um, and it and allowed him to put the content in that he wanted and make it look exactly the way he wanted. So very cool. Yeah. Uh, and and Bob, you said when you had her set up, you said, okay, let's not do the big guys and the or not as far as the big publishers and everything like that. It made it sort of challenging because I didn't know when I was going through Kickstarter, I don't have names just readily in my head. And when I was thinking through names, I'd kick, of course, when you, you skim kick, Kickstarter at first, you don't read every one of them because right. it gets exhausting. And then like half of them are half naked women, but you don't know if there's a story there. And then you finally get to the ones you're like, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. But you're like, oh, wait, why did I stop? Oh, because I recognize that artist or that writer or that something. Um, yeah. And so for me, like my example I'm pulling right now is uh, Stranger Comics. Uh, they hit it big because there's the rumor that HBO Max has bought uh, the Unsunda 
I think that's how you pronounce it, World. Uh, but Stranger Comics is a, I think it's it's an all black owned um, company or whatever. But they have a lot of Kickstarters. So here's one of them called Essa Assessa. Assess, but Seven. it's like in this entire world, and they, this one's signed. And this is the Kickstarter cover for the comic. Um, but it was sort of cool, like. It's this entire world they created, and this is sort of you know, they introduce in this book. They're introducing a new character to the story, where you have Neo Niobe, then you have uh, there's a big ogre like character. I can't remember his name. And some of the books are from a speculator standpoint have jumped up and are worth a lot. But I just sort of think it's cool. It's a great way to bring your fans in. And what I like about smaller labels sort of doing it, like you said. They just want their books out there. They want people to have them in their hands. They want shows like ours to talk about them. They just want they just want that chance for stuff to be said. And like the entire reason I have that book is because I bought these. They have these beautiful hip hop variants. Um, mm-hmm. This is a uh, just a beautiful cover, and I bought oh, Tribe Called Quest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I bought. There's a I think that's what set. that's supposed to be. Yeah, and I and I bought the set of. I think there's another one they have is the also Soul cover, and then they did a, a Notorious B.I.G. cover. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're all great, but they, they sent this with it. And this book's great. I read it. It's a, it's just sort of, sort of funny. If you like the sword and so sorcery type of stuff, it's a, it's a good read. Um, I think the, and it's one of those, like none of the names are names I would have stopped and said, Oh yeah, I want, I want that because so-and-so is on the book. I mean, I, the writers are Sebastian A. Jones and Joshua Cozine Koz, or Kazine and the artist is Kanan White. Um, and for me, those are those are people I haven't heard of. But because yeah. I went through the small label, a label that I was interested in, I bought a few books because I liked them. Because Jay Lee did some covers of for Untamed for the book, so I've been interested and in started looking at them. It, it does help, like you said, adding those names to like Mike Lilly. Okay, I'm, I still recognize, so now I might stop and look at a different book that you, he did because you mentioned his name. Yeah, no, when we did the Shelter Division um, Kickstarter. One of the things that I really wanted uh, that I like about Kickstarter, like you said, is uh, the exclusivity of it. You know, and one of the things I've always done with my Kickstarters is whatever you're buying on that Kickstarter, like you can't get that. You know, it's not Mm -hmm. like, all right, this has been Kickstarted. So now you can get it anywhere because we funded it. Um, I got to a point where I was like, I wanted the Kickstarter to be this is the only place you can get it. Um, We, you know, the covers that we did on Kickstarter for Shelter Division, they were only Kickstarter covers. Uh, So if that book ever is to be distributed through Diamond for whatever reason we want to, it would be done with different covers. Uh, The covers that we did, those were Ken Perry's covers. And uh, so it it, it made it like, you know, almost four collectors to be like, you know, this is the only place you can get it. It's gonna be super rare because we're only printing however many we need. Uh, we're not printing 3,000 of these to, you know, give to 400 people. Um, but, and it does, it bring it, it gives you a chance to, I remember when I did Salvagers, like, I don't know, I think it was like Kickstarter, like, my, like issue number five or six, um, I had Ken Lashley do a cover for oh, me. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, nice. So yeah. I got I, we automatically cover. recognize that name. We're like, oh yeah, Ken Lashley, we know him. Exactly. <laughs> so I had Ken Lashley this cover for me and you know i got you know i got somebody to do colors for it and ken looked at it and he was like you know you can't go with those colors uh and you know and it was like and and, and, like you could see like ken was like taking care of his work you know he's like this is my work and like you know you need so he introduced me to juan fernandez who now i have juan fernandez you know he's done dc and marvel stuff so Mm -hmm. in that whole process like of working with ken and then working with uh, Juan Fernandez and uh, working with uh, Tyler Kirkham, you know, you and like they'll be like, no, listen, you're going to work. We're going to give it to this anchor. Uh, and then you meet this yeah. anchor. This anchor like works for Marvel. And so, you know, the process of doing that, it's not just uh, for spreading. It doesn't work just for spreading, like getting more more eyes on it. But uh, as a creator, you want to keep, you know, you, like you want to work with, you know, the indie people. But, you know, anybody that says that, you know, they don't want to work with somebody who's been to, you know, the top of, you know, Mount Everest and back. Like, you definitely want to work with them. And you hope that in working with them, you, uh, you know, you get, you, you know, you get experience. You get improved. Like, you, you're able to improve be- uh, from that. Okay. So, they get who- net- like, network network and new talent in and fresh eyes on a project and that whole – that's great. Because yeah. working with other creative people, like, they'll, you know, they'll – 
you might write a script and you might be like, this is how I want it laid out. And then they'll be like, nah, you, like, you want to do this or that. And it looks so much better. And you like, and then you learn like, you know, this was, this perspective was better because of the way the panels are moving and the characters, you know, all that bullshit. Yeah. Nice. All right. <laughs> so what would be your second Kickstarter book that you want to talk about? Well, here? I apologize for looking at my phone, but oh yeah, it was because I had Ruben and if I'm going to share my, I'm going to share my screen. I had Ruben finally send me uh, the agency. Uh, anyway, so uh, it is called The Agency, and it's by Ruben Romero. And he was he he was the founder of Think Alike Productions, which was uh, the the first publisher that I ever published Source Point Press or um, sorry, Salvagers with. And they are out of Florida, like just, it was just like, you know, a guy and uh, his friends that were doing this story called The Agency, where uh, this, you know, team of, you know, the special team, they, they were all magicians and they all had different uh, powers through magic. And they, this little boy found out that he had the power of magic and he, you know, comes on with these, uh, these, this group of people that are, uh, one can open up portals. Uh, the other one can, you know, turn people into things. Like it's really cool. Uh, the art was really. Like, I think like what got me was the art. Like uh, this was when I first started out doing comics, and uh, this was like the first independent comic book that I saw that had a really good level of art and the lettering work. Like so, I really felt like these guys were putting together something at a professional level, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciated that. And Ruben Romero, he was, uh, you know, he was hungry. You know, he really wanted to make it in the comic book industry. And, you know, and he's still doing that. He's still going at it. He's still creating. Um, but uh, they, this book was, was, it was interesting to me because it was kind of like a team up of superheroes, but with a twist where they just all had this magical powers and they fought, you know, it was almost kind of like a, um, Back, like being in like in an 80s kid was like you know Thundercats, He-Man. <laughs> it was good versus evil, and it was just popcorn. Like you know there was, it wasn't like there was any kind of thing like where you had to like deep like go into this deep depth like level to uh, mm -hmm. understand something. It was just good versus evil, and it was refreshing. So that was my second book, The Agency by uh, Think Alike Productions and Ruben Romero. Yeah, I, I just pulled up the Kickstarter and looking at it, like you can even like see like the first six pages from it to truly get a gr grasp of like what it looks like. Uh, so that's sort of cool. I, I like it when I can sort of read a little bit into it to sort of see, okay, is this going to, because covers are deceptive to how like the, whether or not the art or the story matches up with the covers. And we talk about this on all our shows. Like sometimes we pick a cover and we don't like the interior art at all or even the story, <laughs> yeah. but we love the extra, the, the, the art on the cover but then also there's been books we I, we've picked because the story is just amazing and then the art in is good too or it just goes together so well um, yeah i think as a, as a creator when i first came in like i didn't you know I, it's people had different opinions about like by having somebody having a different artist do the cover of your book uh, mm. i always had somebody do the cover of my books because it was like the artists the, that i worked with had day jobs like they were just trying to break in too so it took them forever to do the pages where I was like, well, while you're doing that, I'll have somebody else do the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I started doing that. And, but I mean, it was like, it wasn't like something where I, I personally didn't want to go where like, you're having like Mike Mignola do the cover of your book. And then it's Jim Lee artwork on the inside. Like that's just a little too jarring. <laughs> yeah. You, know? but, you, know, you, you want it, you want it to kind of be, like if you're looking at the cover of the book, you kind of expect, like, you know what you're about to expect to open it up. Yeah. Like well, and that, that's been my struggle with the current DC world and, and Marvel because they all have so many different cover artists that, like, sometimes the cover... Now, I'm okay with the art being different. Like, I'm okay with getting a, a, a Perillo to do the cover of a sexy Red Sonja book, even though the interiors might look different because, you know what, I'm paying for the cover because it's art. Yeah. I'm not paying for the in interiors, but when it's just close, but not quite right, it really bothers, like, you, like you, uh, Mignola, Jim Lee is a good comparison. Like, I like both of them, but man, it would fr frustrate me if I, if I bought a Mignola cover to see a Jim Lee interior or vice versa. Like, those two just don't go together in my head. They no. do great books, just not together. 
together. Mm. What's funny is like, I didn't even think about this, but I remember I bought a bat. I was big into Tom, Todd McFarlane when he first did Spider-Man. And mm. I bought, like, I don't know if it's a popular comic book now, but I bought this Batman comic book. And I normally did not buy Batman comic books, but Todd McFarlane did the cover of it. And I bought it without looking inside. And when I opened it up and it wasn't Todd McFarlane's art, I was like, this is bullshit. And <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the question is, it is it the is it the four Todd McFarlane covers are like the most sought after in that entire Batman run. But the I don't think he did the interiors. You had 423, which is this gorgeous silhouette, gothic looking thing. And then he did yeah. the little year two run he did yeah, I think three other four covers in year two where it's the grim reaper yeah and, but i don't think he did the insides on any of them yeah. um, no, he didn't do the <laughs> they were yeah <laughs> all right pete what's your what's your second book all right well since we're just talking covers i'll go with my second pick here now i normally don't buy these books or whatever but, uh, you know you have like six boxes no but uh, I grabbed this you know, naughty and nice book because I, <laughs> at a time, was trying to get all of Kendrick Lim's covers because oh, it yeah. wasn't that hard to do. Like, there wasn't that many of them. Now there's been so many more that I just can't keep up. But this was an older one he did, part of a Kickstarter for the uh, the Zombie King Gambit. And I covered it up. There's no nudity on it, but it is a bit suggestive. So I did put a post-it <laughs> note just to kind of cover that little area up. So, uh, But I did just get this just for the cover because, again, I, I was looking for the artist and... Uh, that's the only reason I grabbed this one. And the only way to get it was through a Kickstarter or the secondary market. Yeah. yeah afterwards, obviously. But uh, as you said, sometimes with Kickstarter, they have <laughs> covers that are just there. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> it sells. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it I'm sells, about to show man. one too. So <laughs> I feel like always I'm doing a Kickstarter, you go to Kick Track, and it's always like some you know, big boob ladies in space that are like, you know, killing it. And you're yep. just like, you talk to your husband, you're like, can I just write a boob story? And you're like, yeah, don't tell it here. <laughs> you just got to find the right label because you, you know the labels are that they'll sign you in a heartbeat if you write just Geniscope. somewhat of a. Here's yep. Geniscope. Here's my tits and ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though they, they are actually switching gears a little bit. I mean, here they lately, really are. I saw I mean, they're actually trying to have stories. <laughs> <laughs> all right mike oh, wait, there's, wait, there's pages there's pages inside those books what <laughs> it's actually right. a bunch of ads for marvel comics back in the day <laughs> <laughs> no one knows that there's like all the marvel value stamps that's where they're kept <laughs> yep all right all right round so, three <laughs> so for for my last one I, I i did go with sort of a tna cover but i i did it because I, I always want to support this title. I love the character. Uh, Chris, you were already mentioning like that you would buy a, a Perillo cover because you're buying the cover. Um, but I, there, there was, I guess, a point where Frank Cho was really passionate about um, Red Sonia, and they did a Kickstarter for just that. I just got this last week. He just wanted to do a cover. The, it was for an older issue. It was like issue 13. We're already on like issue 20. Um, and they did a Kickstarter for it. I know it's not a small publisher, but it's it's Red Sony that always kind of, like I feel like I'm the only guy who reads this title. Uh, and I really <laughs> want the, I really want the title to survive. Uh, so I supported it because I want the title to survive. And I love Cho's work. Um, and I love also that Cho is doing some some small indie stuff now. He's working with AWA uh, for his Fight Girls, um, his creator-owned Fight Girls story, which drops soon. Um, I've seen previews of it already. And he, it seems like he's he's pushing more towards that arena of the comic industry. When I talked to him, I guess it was like a year and a half ago, we were talking about a lot of that and how, um, you know, he's been stifled over the years by some of the some of the big houses making him do certain things with his characters and stuff and he doesn't like that so he said you know i want to do this stuff my way i want to do this story my way i want to i want to bring it to a company that will allow me to do it that way so while this is dynamite obviously and that's not there's nothing small about dynamite dynamite i love that he had passion for the character um and and my and my want to keep the to keep the the title going, I put my money where my mouth is, and I, I ordered a copy of it. But um, I like what I like what Frank is doing. I like that he's taking his popularity and moving it away from sort of the big the big boys and moving it more towards smaller stuff. I think that's that's great for him. And I think that's great for us fans of his that we're going to get to see things that way, and I'm going to get to, get to support a smaller company instead of maybe one of the bigger the bigger places. So, 
Okay. All right. So my, for my th third book, uh, this one, it I can't quite figure out why it's is more than this one right here. Once oh, on yeah. land. Oh yeah. This is like it's a it's a scout, but it's actually like it was a Kickstarter first, and it was a he wrote the guy wrote it and drew it all interior. Uh, I opened it up to read it and. It's a, it's a it's a fun. I can't quite nail it down, and I'm not. It's one of those books. I'm. I know there's a Once Our Land two, but I'm not sure if there's a three. Um, but like, just sort of fun sepia tone colors drawings. Uh, the guy who created it is named Peter Rick of R R I C K or R I C Q. Um, but one of the things is when the kids are talking in the story. I don't know if you can sort of see. Uh, oops, wrong way. They're speaking in German. I was so going to say, you, wasn't that in German? So you you get the the text box. The narrator is all in English, but the the at that one in this one particular first part of the story, it's all German. I'm like, what the heck's going on? Uh, <laughs> because it doesn't it's really explain what they're saying. Like you just have to read the context of what they're saying. But uh, hey, I watched. I got on Kickstarter because one of the things I've noticed with Kickstarter, you guys get to do like fun little quirky videos trying to sell your books. And this guy took it to like the next level where it's like him sitting in a chair and he's just talking about his, he's in like a little professor suit or something. He's like, and da, da, da. And I'm like, what the hell, what is your book? About? I can't even figure out what the book's about. And then, then he goes into another thing and then he's eating, he's eating a bowl of cereal in the video. I'm like, what is going on in this video that has anything to do with this book? So, so Chris, the Kickstarter for that was actually for the hardcover. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and then when the hardcover did really well, they split the hardcover in half and did a two issue ah. in store thing. So not, not that I'm not taking away from their picks. I had never seen the hardcover for sale. So I, I yeah. would buy one if I could find one. Um, but I guess that's the way they initially funded it. And then it got popular. Yeah. So, yeah. cause like I looked it up, like, I mean, I, I just happened to find it in a bin. I've never, like, I've only ever seen one copy of this, the one I have in my hand, but it's, <laughs> it's a 15 to like you said, it's Bob, it's a, it, they sell them for 15, 20, 30 bucks because they're just, it was, I don't know, but like it's it's an actually interesting story. I'd be curious to see where it goes if they ever go anywhere with it. There's there's so many indie books out there that start and never finish. Well, that's and a, you're yeah, just that's, like that's a big part of it, and that's the big gamble. And I think like yeah. as a creator, when you have um, because I've been there, I've been there with my issue one of Salvagers, and then my issue one and two, and then my issue one, two, and three, and uh, you know, and again, that's another pro like thing that you'd have. Because you'd have, I mean, as an inexperienced person, you'd be like, all right, I'm going to a convention, you know, give me, you know, 50 issues of one, two, and three. And, uh, you know, because you, you don't, you're not, you know, you're, you're stupid. And you get there and then you're like, you're at the table and people are you're like, yeah, you know, like you buy all of them for 15 bucks. And they're like, I'll take number one. And you're like, all right, here's number one. And next thing you know, you're like, shit, I only have two number ones left. And I still have 40 number twos left and <laughs> three number threes left. So what the hell am I going to do? So like, you know, you would, you get to a point where you'd be like, you discount them and you're like, here, take two and three and then I'll send you a free PDF of one. Or you do anything you can. But again, like what you're saying is like, nobody knows that you're going to be around again. So, you know, it's, yeah. it, it is that it's a, it's almost like you're, you're, you're breaking the sound barrier. You know, it's so hard to, get these out and to be consistent with it. And again, go through those, you know, gut wrenching, soul crushing moments and be like, no, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep spending my hard earned money on making something that isn't giving me any kind of profit. Uh, you know, no, like who in the right mind would do that? Me, I did it. But who <laughs> in the right, mind would do that? right. Yeah. So yeah. Like, as a creator, you feel like I better effing succeed at what I'm doing or all of that was just really dumb. <laughs> I definitely get that mentality. I mean, you were talking before about just, you know, you maybe you get one person to leave a con with your book. And I can remember playing shows early on when you're just humping it and there's one person in the audience and you're like, uh, is that person going to walk out with my CD? Screw it. I'll just give it to them. That yeah. way they, <laughs> they sat through the whole show. They liked it enough for that. So I'll just literally let them walk out with it and whatever it's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just happy that it got in someone's hands. He probably used it as a coaster that night, but whatever, you know, it's just one of those things where yeah. you just, yeah. you're right. You beg, borrow and, and scrape and steal for whatever you can to get. 
to get it at first because you're you're humping it and you got to work from somewhere at the bottom. Everybody had to at some point. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like you want to be able to look at yourself and be like, I had a passion for something and I wanted to do something and I yeah. I tried. I did. I did my bit, and I can actually look at myself and say, you know, you gave it one hundred percent, and you know that you should be happy with wherever you are to be able to say that. Agreed. So, does Kickstarter make it easier to think through that? Like, you have a vision in your head, or is it? Or like, Kickstarter is horribly like. You know, I I probably have lost money on every successful Kickstarter I've ever done. You know, but it's, you know, for me, again, it was a, it was a means of distribute distribution. I, you know, I wasn't going to conventions. I didn't really, you know, latch on to a publisher yet that like I could, you know, go to conventions. I, you know, I I didn't have a name where people were like, yeah, we'll pay for you to go to this convention. So for me, it was like, somebody said, they're like, well, you know, go on Kickstarter. Like people, there's an audience that buys their comics from Kickstarter. So I started doing that. And I think the first Kickstarter I did, I was like talking to my friends and my family. I'm like, can you please just, I was like, if you just back it for a hundred dollars, like I'll give you your hundred dollars back. <laughs> like $2,000. And it took me 30 days and asking for a lot of favors to get that over 2000. Uh, but, you know, just through perseverance and getting the comic book out and you figure again, like if you give your comic book out to, you know, 20 people, if two of those people are like, oh, I like it, I'm going to follow this guy. And then they backed your Kickstarter, then that's something. So, um, you know, the Kickstarter was a great avenue for distribution. And that's where I think I started to build the fan base was on Kickstarter. And then that spilled over to Facebook, Instagram and all that. I do have to say what Kickstarter allows you to have is I will click on it and just scroll. And I'll just skim through it. And if you have a, especially if you get slicker and slicker at your initial video or if if you have a video or your initial paragraph and you're, you're the writer, so you better have a damn good paragraph to sell your (laughs) book. But like that, whatever it is that catches my eye at the very beginning, if it's well done, I'm going to open up and read further. And then I'm going to look at your, whether it's a dollar or $10 or $15 and I'll look at the rewards and decide, okay, And I mean, whether or not I want to continue on, I mean, I can't imagine some of the thinking through, whoa, we've, we funded. Okay. What's my reward going to be if they do a thousand dollars? I mean, like uh, what's that reward? Like if I can get a thousand dollars, hell I'll marry your sister. If that's what it takes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, like you definitely want to give all the different price options. I always think like you want, if you can get, um, you know, uh, the original artwork for one of your variant covers, you know, you throw that up, like you, you're probably buying it for $300. So you throw it up there for $500 and then they get, you know, the freaking t-shirt package along with that for mm-hmm. free. Uh, because you want to put the word free in the verbiage <laughs> when you're asking somebody for $500. Like, $500 and I'm going to give you something for free. Uh, so, um, you know, you like, and then you want to go all the way down to like the $1, you know, because... You want to give like people that are out there supporting like a ton of Kickstarters their option to get it digitally. And like, you know, every time you see somebody bought your comic digitally, you're like, that's zero overhead for me. So awesome. Yeah. I'll be taking your dollars. Yeah. Um, and does then that it fall to you as the, cre- as the artist, I mean, the, as the writer, or does it fall to the artist? Like who, f- well, I mean, a Kickstarter went like the money that I got from those things went to paying the artist, printing the comic, and usually I always fucked up on the shipping. So that came out of my pocket. <laughs> like, I think the first yeah, time I did it, it and I did like, I, I didn't realize like when you do a poster, you got to put it in this big ass thing. And then that, you know, so yeah, my shipping yeah. costs were phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> Those are tubes are expensive and then the shipping them are expensive. It's, it's a pain in the ass. Right. Like you're shipping things internationally and you're like, People are like, how are you going to charge me? You're charging me $5 for the comic. But you're charging me $25 for shipping. And I'm like, you live in Russia. Like, what do you want me to do? Don't buy I'm not shipping. charging you. I'm not keeping that money. <laughs> right. I'm like, it, it costs a lot of money to ship something to you. So, Well, that, that backfired on us. We, we had a giveaway, and we chose the winner, and we found out he lives in Ireland. 
And I'm just like, crap, well, it was supposed to be like a $5 thing. Now it's a $40 zip thing. <laughs> What'd you say? Mike, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Mike. Where's your card? <laughs> so Mike's still muted. He's still muted. <laughs> There you go. There you go. I'm gonna try that again. Of course, we didn't choose a floppy either. Or something yeah. cheap to ship. We chose a hardcover, which is like, oh man. So we got to ship it all overseas, and it's like really heavy. That was dumb. I mean, we're 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 that we had no problem because he's a great great fan and everything. But it was yeah. one of those like, oh wait, no, we chose we chose someone like. Of course, you don't ask where do you live before we give away something. <laughs> do you live down the road? Can I just walk over and hand it to you? <laughs> Yeah, your content now are U.S. only, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Oh, man. All right. So let's see. Wait. Oh, yeah. We need your last book. Bob. Mine? Yeah. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to try to share my screen one more time. And if I can get the. Can you see my screen now? Nothing's coming up for me. No, nor me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Your entire screen application, Chrome tab. All right. Anyway, um, my second book, and I'm just going to pull it up on my screen, is called Voodoo Nations. Uh, it is by, written by Travis Gibb, and the artist is Luke Stone. These guys are friends of mine. Uh, Travis Gibb is a independent creator who's always supporting all of us independent creators. Uh, you know, there's a few people out there in the industry. Again, it's called Voodoo Nations uh, that are constantly just out there pushing the independent uh, creator family or universe as a whole. And uh, Travis Gibb is one of them. And he, you know, every time he puts out these books, um, you can see like he's just stepping up his game. And Voodoo Nation is a really cool book about uh, this man and woman. They go to Brazil and they go into like, you know, the back uh jungles of brazil and they are trying to teach um you know their religion they're kind of on a pilgrimage to teach their religion to the native folk who are being ruled by this voodoo master and they you know it's it's a really it's a story where like you really kind of see this balance like this not balance but um this contrast between, you know, religions that are accepted and to religions that are, you know, we look at as a little taboo and, uh, but there is definitely like the, this, I, I got this sense of like this, you know, and I hate to bring up religion, but, um, you know, religion, like religion always seems like it's shaky ground with people and oh, yeah. uh, Travis, when he's writing it, not at all. yeah, he, he did not, um, leave out the, you know, that, kind of feeling like that I'm having right now that yeah. while you're reading it, you kind of feel like awkward about, you know, the whole religious uh, overtones of things. And like then, that. you know, this guy, Bishop Lucas comes in, who's just like, you know, how you would imagine any voodoo, you know, Bishop or priest, you know, they're always just that, you know, James Bond kind of evil. And this is what this guy is. <laughs> just running this town that uh, these uh, these Christian pilgrimage people came into. And, um, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but he, uh, he messes things up. And okay. that's just issue one. That's the only one I got. <laughs> before, was issue one. So issue two, I think, goes into Ash Wednesday. Oh, okay. Two Nations by Travis Gibb and Luke Stone. Cool. Awesome. All right, Pete, what's your third book and final? Oh, last book. All right. Uh, last book. I guess this might lean, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit towards the the bigger name. Not really a huge name, but uh, we had, Nico had uh, Jimmy Palmiotti on uh, on his weekend update interview, and he was talking about his creator-owned uh, thing he was doing with uh, Dave Johnson, the Pop Kill book, and he was talking about it. I was interested, hopped onto his Kickstarter, and got myself you know, one of the books. Uh, I had to put a little bit of again post-it tabs on here because this uh, this issue it has a little bit of nudity on the cover. So I a little bit. It. There's like 72 dots on there. I <laughs> see a theme here. I had a cover. <laughs> Where's the cover? All I see is stickers. Well, I can show you the cover, but then I don't know. But <laughs> I, I really dug. I mean, this is the Dave Johnson cover. Um, 
Jimmy's wife, uh, Amanda Connor, did another cover, but that was already sold out from the Kickstarter because I wanted to get the Amanda Connor, Connor cover, but uh, it was already gone. But uh, that's also uh, an interesting cover as well. But uh, it's, it's an interesting book, and I think they just did uh, issue two was uh, recently. Uh, they did also through Kickstarter. Okay. Very. Uh, but, so yeah, last pick. I always loved like it was it was fun digging through the click Kickstarters and sort of looking at them, and also Bob talking to you about it. But we want to talk about the book that you just had that dropped, and like I've loved, I loved it. I bought it when it came out, and actually right now I'm being truthful. Like I actually thought it was. I like the story. I like the way it ended. I don't want to reveal how. It, like just that it ended with something. That I'm like, I got damn it. I got to buy the next book too, which is how you want the books to end. Um, yeah. You don't want them to. Okay, well it's a it's a complete story or whatever, but. Um, Wait, the, with a little cliffhanger. Yeah, I, I I like that a lot. The um, freaking dude in the mask is awesome. The the gas mask. Yep. But and one of the books I it's coming in the mail and it's going to be in our slides. We're going to talk about is uh, for it's this variant. Oh shoot, I can't remember the artist. It's freaking awesome. Yeah, um, I do. I do got the slide. I, I do got the slide for for uh, for that. But it's yeah. uh, what's the guy? It's for Black Cape Comics. Did it? Uh, wow, Black Cape Comics. Uh, yeah. Jay Ferguson. Yeah, Ferguson's cover. Oh my gosh. When I saw that, like Man. I know it, it's yeah. It's just like close up on the mask. Yeah. yeah. It also has this the new thing they're doing, metal covers. Yeah. Metal. Which I don't quite yeah. understand. I, 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 I want to buy one. They're always sold out. Wait, yeah, what'd you I, say? I said I haven't I have never like put my hands on a metal cover before. So I'm, I mean that back there the showing one off a wooden one. But. My comps on. So they like, <laughs> read the fine print, bud. You don't yeah, get metal covers. <laughs> that's where yeah, you go can you do 11 so i get one hey, of them. from now on i'm gonna give you guys i'm gonna tell them you guys give me a mike you're gonna i'm gonna go back i'm gonna get your shipping address and i'm gonna tell <laughs> sort of to ship all of my comps to you and then i trust you to, to send it back to you all of your all of your fan base <laughs> <laughs> there, there, it's the entire clan of john mayer john mayer fanboys out there looking for mike's <laughs> <laughs> well now i gotta put that image in because it won't make sense if I don't. Just the first <laughs> album. Just the first one. The second one doesn't sound anything like that. <laughs> Thank God. But um, so I guess um, are you? is it going to second print? Have you figured that out yet? Well, I mean, right now it's a funny thing because it's right. You know, last week was when it came out. It was supposed to come out the week before. Yeah. Uh, uh, then it came out last week, last Wednesday. And then as it was coming out, I, you know, I obviously I talked to a lot of shop owners and, you know, several of them said like, uh, oh, we didn't get our shipment. It's not coming until next week. But so I'm thinking like, you know, in my, again, you keep learning new things all the time. So I'm thinking like that meant that they didn't ship it out to anybody, but then people started posting it and I started talking to other shop owners and, that were like, we just, we sold out of this, you know? And, uh, so then I was like, oh, all right. so it did make it out to some. And, you know, so now we'll see what happens tomorrow. Hopefully it hits a whole new crop of shops. And um, I know I know that I would say I think we're down to like the last couple hundred copies mm -hmm. that Source Press has. So yeah. whatever happens, you know, tomorrow and for the rest of the week, I guess will depend. I think what publishers look at is how fast the first issue sells out. Um, and then whether or not they do a second printing of it. So if it's, it's sold out next week, I can't imagine that they wouldn't. But yeah. you know, if it goes on longer than it, they might. It, it's fascinating to me now because comics before they even hit their shelf have a second print that comes out like the next week. And Mar well, Marvel and DC yeah. are getting sick. Well, so they know, you know, like so when you, when they make a comic and they send it to Diamond, they've already they've already printed however many they think that they're going to have. Mm. Uh, and then, so they're like, "All right, we're printing four thousand copies." Um, I think because of COVID, Source Point Press only like printed three thousand copies of Broken Gargoyles, assuming that the numbers were going to be down because of COVID. Uh, right. So imagine, if you will, if like the numbers came back and it was like thirty five hundred copies were ordered. So that means their three thousand is immediately sold out, and they're going right to second print uh, yeah. before yeah. those even come out. Um, so that, you know, with, with, you know, so this, you know, once they sell out, they'll, you know, I, I hope so. I would love it to go to second print. Cause I feel like when you, your book goes to second print, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, fans or speculators, like it's, 
you've done enough uh, where people think that what you're doing is worth something and they're going out there and buying it and the publisher thinks that it's worth enough to do another printing of it. Yeah. But but with this, I do have to admit when I first saw the sort of theme or the steampunk sort of look, that was, to me was like a risky play because steampunk is one of those things. Sometimes people love it. Sometimes people, and I, know, I know I'm generalizing. I'm or big time general. Diesel punk has even less, like if you, like I've been hashtagging shit. So <laughs> I've been posting things and I've been hashtagging steampunk because I'm like, I look at, at the hashtag tag on diesel punk and it's so much freaking smaller. So I'm like, you know what? We're throwing all the punks in there. If you're a punk of anything, you're going to be a punk of it, like fan of this. So uh, diesel punk, I think was, you're right. Like it's, it's a risky play because there's people out there that are like, I don't care for steampunk. I don't, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a diesel punk guy. So even though it might look interesting, they're going to be like, yeah, I pass because that's not my thing. Like I'm not into mm -hmm. horror. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not into sci-fi. Like, so, uh, but I, I, I liked when Travis brought the idea of doing it in diesel punk. I, it fit. I mean, it worked for the yeah. story. If you, you know, as a writer, they always tell you, like, if you take away something and it doesn't lose value to the story, then it wasn't meant to be there. And I think if you took out the diesel punk aspect of the story, it wouldn't be as interesting. No. I mean, I, I, I thought that added so much to it. Like, when I was reading, like, I'm just, like, my initial impression when you see the first cover, it, you're it, just it, like, it, okay. Because it's a comic book, more, it gives it that, it gives it more sense of darkness, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Yeah. No, I, I, like, yeah, it, it, but it definitely, I mean, part of the reason I want to talk about that is just because most people, when they first look at a comic book, it's, okay, this is Broken Gargoyles. Okay, that's an interesting title. I'm not quite sure. I open it up. It looks that diesel punk, steampunk sort of look. Do I really want to go into that type of world, that this Mad Max into the world type of feel? Um, but I do have to say, seeing the, uh, Jay Ferguson cover. I was like, damn it, I gotta buy that one strictly just based off the cover. I, I, I say I don't like Diesel Punk, but this cover is freaking badass. And then, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then, like, I read the story. I'm like, I wanted this that character who's on the J, the Jay Ferguson's cover. I'm like, he is so interesting to me. I want to find out more about this infantry and what happened and all these different things. I'm like, I'm sold on the, this war story that you just alluded to, and I have no clue. Like, I, I like, I'm going. Okay, it better not be twelve issues because I don't know if I have the stamina for twelve issues of this one arc. But I can do four. I can do six. Wait, what? Wait, what'd you say? Nine issues. Nine issues. Nine, there you go. Split Nine the difference. Issues. Nine issues. But yeah, no, and uh, you know, and again, like to give something away, I guess a lot of people when they look at the cover and then they read the book, they're like, "That's not what I was expecting." Yeah. Like, you know, like they're like, "I just, I from the cover alone, I just expected." you know, good versus evil. And that was like, that was on purpose. Like I, I, I know not to try to trick anybody, but as, as, as the story goes on, like you do see that it's again, like good versus evil, but it's on so many different levels. Uh, mm. And it's also, you know, mix matched. Uh, my mm. inspiration for like the way that I, you know, developed the characters was like breaking bad. Uh, one of the things I loved about breaking bad was like, when you really go like, look into it, you're like, who is the bad guy? Mm. And who is the good guy? Like, you know, they're, yeah. it's even when you thought like Walter White was doing good, it was like all of a sudden, even his wife at one point, you were like, oh, dude, she's gangster. You know, <laughs> and then Gus at one point, like, shit, Gus wasn't that bad. He was keeping things together. Uh, yeah. So I really loved that about Breaking Bad. And I really wanted to put it. You know, so I was very cognizant about that when I was writing the story where, you know, every hero does what they do for a reason. And, you know, sometimes that reason might be selfish. And so not everybody who seems like they're good is good and not everybody who's bad is bad. So That's cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it. Again, mine came in today, so I didn't get a chance to read it yet. But uh... Well, please, again, like message me. I would love to hear your thoughts. Good, bad, the ugly. I like to hear what people think about it. I'll, I always feel like I get something out of that. Um, okay, so, Bob, we do have one story for you that Pete's going to share with you because you met him before. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, I, I did meet you at uh, Wizard World Philly. 
Uh, my buddy Andy Tomberland had me go to the Wizard World Philly because he had an ogre cover. I think that was for that show, and I had to go pick Jeremy it up. Clark. And then, yes, I, I met and I talked to you. And then you took me over. You introduced me to Jeremy Clark. You walked me over to I think the other Source Point press guys. You introduced me to them. Like it, you were very generous with your time. Like, you left your booth and basically walked me through. But did he give you the, the box of books around. that he gives away to everyone? Did you get the box of books? <laughs> I didn't get the box, but I did get that second print that we talked about earlier. I did buy that there, and I did get the, the covers for Clint and for uh, for Andy, as well as myself. Well, you know what? And, and I feel like I actually – I do remember that moment because I feel like that – you know, and I, if anybody from Wizard World watching, like you were probably the only person that I interacted with there. Yeah, it was, um, it was uh, pretty pretty slow. I mean, it was yeah, and uh, and I I hate saying this, and I feel like you know you always try to avoid talking bad about things, but um, there's certain conventions you go to that you're just like this. Like I remember when Philadelphia Wizard World was packed, uh, right. and this was it was sad to see. Like it was just I feel like it was almost half the half the uh, auditorium, if you will, or the whatever they yeah. call them, was filled. And um, and it, it just the, the, you know the attendance was just wasn't great, but yeah. so I do in that horrible story I do remember uh, you know I remember talking to you and taking you over. Jeremy Clark was all the way at the end, and he did that fantastic cover. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, it was it was those are the things though. Like when you're at conventions, you know I like I don't do it where I feel like I'm trying to go overboard to sell you a book. It's just, I feel like when I'm at a convention, like I'm a 13 year old kid again and I'm excited about all that shit. Yeah. Uh, and if you come at me and you're a 13 year old kid and we're <laughs> like, dude, do you want to go see a dead body? And you're like, yeah, oh, like, like, that's Stand by me. <laughs> And so when I'm at a convention, Stand by like, me. right. And like when I'm at a convention, like I've, I've been at conventions where like you're working with people and they're like, dude, you got to stop talking to people for so long. You just talk to that guy for 15 minutes and you sold him one book. And I'm like, I like, that's, that's me. Like I'm like, I like talking to people. I like interacting with people. And I feel like I want to come away, not just selling you a book, but I want to make a, like, I want to make a fan. I want to make a friend. Yeah. No, I still, and again, you, now we're, we're still talking about this over a year later. I still remember this story because, you know, of what we did, our interaction and going around the show. I still remember it. I so, buy, I mean, I bought your Source that. Point Press books and your books because of that. Cause I'm like, hey, I know who this is. <laughs> right. And I, I love, I love this show. I love this show as a result of that too. Cause now when con seasons open back up again and all you guys are back out in physical form, and we get to meet you in person. It'd be really cool to just, um, we'll just shoot the shit, grab a beer, yeah, grab lunch, a talk about the nerdy shit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then give me a box of free comics. Yeah, box. Exactly. <laughs> Joking. Well, no, but it, but it, go ahead. Oh, Mike froze. You know, now oh. community that much more personal. Well, and one of the things, that, and, and you're going to cause me to do this too. I'm going to have to go look for Ogre now. Um, is every, any party we interview or anything we do, <laughs> we end up spending so much money oh, after yeah. the fact. And, and the problem is, yes, we're, we, we're on a speculation site. We end up spending our money. And um, like last week, we had Axel Alonzo on, and he does AWA Studios, and he was Marvel and all the everything. But his enthusiasm, just like your enthusiasm for Broken Gargoyles, like, I bought Broken Gargoyles because I've been talking to you through Facebook Messenger and all this stuff. I went out and bought the book and I liked it. I'm going to buy two and three and whatever. But uh, and I bought the the variant I really liked. But we did AWA. Mike Petey and I were sending us images, and I swear for three straight days, we <laughs> each had stopped at a comic book store and bought an AWA book because of actual, not because there's spec on it, not because they're yeah. they might sell, because we wanted to get issue one and then issue three I it because. They're there. Like the Ogre books can be a beast to try to track down from what you say. I'm like, great. How am I going to – I can see the King well, Cook I one. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue ones, uh, like the original issue one cover art is like impossible. Yeah. Like, fine. I mean, it's probably not. It's probably on eBay for five bucks. I don't know. <laughs> but I know, I know that no. that one sold out. And like – so then I went through I went through a box of something and I found like 10 copies. And I'll, I'll send all of you. I'll send all three of you one. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> Cause I have them, like I have them right in here. I'm gonna go. Sweet, <laughs> sweet. 
<laughs> I've wanted to read that book for a really long time too, and I haven't been able to find one. So now I'll actually be able to read it. Oh, I got, <laughs> like, I got like I got I got all sorts of stuff. I got this yes. one right here. This one I love this cover. Oh, that's gorgeous. This right here. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So did you say Jeremy Clark did the covers of that? This is the ogre yeah. number one cover that like I think it sold out in two weeks. Yeah, and it was like <laughs> three thousand copies or something. They went to a, a second printing, and I got a bunch of them here. I'll send them to you. Uh, um, I wasn't actually awesome. fishing for covers. I was just talking about. I, know, about how I will know, definitely take them. Like, I have these in my closet. I will very much appreciate that. And I don't know what to do with them. So when I meet somebody who's like, I would love one, then I'm like, I'll give you one. And they're like, how much oh, yeah. do you want for it? I'm like, no, yeah, I want I like, you want it. I want to give it to you because I don't want it to sit in my closet. So when you send them to send them, <laughs> if you send, when you send them to me, um, can you also let's do a giveaway? Let's right. someone watching the show that what yeah. what do you want them to comment on? Maybe name their favorite Kickstarter book or yeah, yeah po like post up name their favorite Kickstarter. If you can put a link or whatever, promote your favorite Kickstarter. Okay. Well, you drop that, guys. Drop that in our comments. Cool. Awesome. Promote your favorite Kickstarter. You will get a Bob Sal Bob Sally book, whatever one he chooses to designate. Is this the free one you get? And yeah. he'll when he when I get it, then I will send it out to you. I'll tell you what. You got whoever comments. You guys pick a, a winger winner, and I will give them a, a copy of Ogre, the complete trade paperback of Ogre and Ogres. Oh, nice, awesome. So that's a trade so, yes. paperback and four awesome. A four issue comic series. Even if you live in Malaysia, you're getting that's <laughs> awesome. In Malaysia, Sadly, I will be out another fifty bucks if that's the case. <laughs> but <sighs> Bob, this is that's I've awesome. Thank so you very much. much for that. That's that's great. I've learned so much from talking yeah, Kickstarters with you, talking the process. The uh, what I love about these interviews is not hey, we got so and so on the show. It's the stories that you can tell, the the hell that you've gone through to get your books to be at this point to where. I sort of knew who you were before, uh, like uh, reaching out or whatever. I, you and I had been uh, following each other on Instagram and yeah, everything, and you've been reaching out to Ben. Social media friends. That's like the yeah. new norm. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, up until uh, Pete, I've never actually. This is better. Person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, Mike, and I are in the same town, so we can actually we actually go comic booking together. But yeah. It's it's a, it's, a, it's our comic book day yeah. that we do yeah. like once a I month. I haven't physically met either of these two yet. <laughs> But uh, the pandemic has caused a lot of uh, Zoom friends nope. now too. So, well, you know what's or, funny is the Zoom thing now. Yeah, like, it's I true. When the, when the pandemic first hit, and a buddy of mine was like, "Hey, do you guys all want to Zoom?" And I was like, "Get the fuck out of here!" Like, no, I don't want to Zoom. <laughs> and then, like a, couple, like a couple months after that, I'm like, I will "Totally Zoom!" Like, I'll I'll do it. Like, let's Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a little bit not in my house. Well, that's like my like some. I have a group, yeah. really group, a closer group group of friends. That we don't get together because of this, but we were we were already not getting together. So it wasn't anything new. It was like we all have kids, we're just at different points in our life or whatever. We're getting old. And then it's like, okay, let's let's do this Zoom call thing. It worked like three times. And we're like, damn it, we're still awkward. We can't talk to each other. I, I have a one-year-old, you have a seven-year-old, you don't have kids. Now what do we talk about? So it's like, okay, this doesn't work the same way. But like we do this, so we get to talk. Like I love getting to talk to people like you, like yeah. I've never met before, or just seeing Pete and Mike once a week or once every two weeks on camera, Zoom or whatever, to talk comics. Like it's it's a great experience uh, no, this that this has opened up. Yeah. I, li I like the, these things when like it's, it's interactive. It's, 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 it's yeah. working. I love it. Absolutely. Because I, again, I love comics. I love hearing the whole Thank process, you. what's going into it. You're like, what you're thinking in creating it and writing it and connecting with art, like, that's all fascinating to me. Like it's, it's a, it, you know, it's, and it's, a, yeah. it's it's an amazing process. Like, you know, you send your script out to an artist, and when that artist, like, even when he just sends you like the like the thumbnails or like the mm -hmm. layout, you're like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it, that, that that wasn't what I was thinking, but that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, or or like getting it back, and something might be off, and like interact and be like, you know, I was thinking more like this or that. Uh, and then, like, getting it inked, and then it comes back and it's completed. And then the colorist sends you, like, like his part. And then you put the letters on it. Like, the whole process is almost like, you know, it's it makes your comic brand new through, like, so many different stages. Yeah, and layers just adding yeah. to the 
and seeing it all come to life and then looking at it and it's like out there you're it's like you you get to a point where you're in disbelief you're like at one point this was just like a concept in my mind had no form and now it's a comic book and it's on shelves like it's just wild mm -hmm. that's that's so true uh thank you uh th once again guys this is three comic money this is comicbookinvest.com uh you you can see it every friday we drop the article we we dropped the video. You can check it out. Um, thank you for joining us, Bob. Uh, thank you, you guys. Go, go to the store. Yeah. Buy Broken Gargoyles. Let's see if we can get a second print just because yeah. I'm excited Let's to get, get a second print. print. <laughs> yeah, we get a second print and we'll find it. Like we get yeah. another artist on it. Yeah. yeah. Everybody <laughs> loves second prints these everybody days. Everybody loves yeah. second prints. I didn't know that. Well, all yeah. of a sudden, everybody I loves it. all the first ah, prints to get to the second print. <laughs> Sadly, that's true for some stores. <laughs> there you go. That's good logic. I like I that. I know that. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, so, so much for your time today. Really, yeah, thank thanks you. for having me, guys. This was awesome.